Good evening, ladies and gentlemen and featured poets. Welcome to the American Writers Museum here in Chicago, Illinois. Welcome everyone on Can TV. And we're very excited to be hosting this event tonight. This is the 24th annual Gwendolyn Brooks Open Mic Awards. I hope you're excited to be here. And I hope, I hope you're excited to hear some great poetry. And I do encourage everyone to come back to the museum when we're open during regular hours. This is a special event and we're really excited to be hosting it. I want to introduce you to Lisa Wagner from the Guild Literary Complex. Good evening. Welcome to Gaboma 2017. Come on, give it up. So every year we continue the legacy of Gwendolyn Brooks with Gwendolyn Brooks Open Mic Awards, which she started 24 years ago. At that award, she gave the check out to the winner. We continue that tradition with her daughter, Nora Brooks Blakely, sending out the check today. So give it up for Nora. <laughs> this is the Centennial Brooks year, and so this Gwendolyn Brooks Open Mic Award for me carries a little extra weight. We did Brooks Day, we are in the fifth year of that. This is the 24th year of Gaboma, which we're heading into our 25th year, and I see a lot of familiar faces. We are blessed tonight with Hakeem Antobuti joining us. <laughs> Last year's winner, Ms. Nicole Bond. <laughs> Cynthia Walls, who's just sitting over there. <laughs> Permissions. And I have the honor to introduce Tony Asante Lightfoot, who is a poet extraordinaire and has been the MC for Gaboma for the years that I have seen it. She is a stalwart poet in the community in Chicago. She studies Chinese medicine and she is a force to be reckoned with. Let me introduce you, Ms. Tony Asante Lightfoot. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here, and I'm always, every year, I'm glad to be here, even the year that I uh, performed, uh, my first year, 2004, and I lost. <laughs> In 2005, I got myself together and channeled all the goodness that I can remember that Mama Gwendolyn Brooks had told me over the years and made a better poem, and I won. <laughs> Thank you, 2005. Koresh Ali Lansana, one of her spiritual and poetic uh, sons, was uh, my, hosted with me that next year in 2006, and I've been hosting ever since. And so this is just like too much. I'm too happy uh, to have all the good people that are here, so many friends that I've made throughout all these years. So it's wonderful to have you here. Um, I also wanted to say, like, this is also a, a really special year in terms of literary achievements because Gwendolyn Brooks was the first black person to win the Pulitzer, and one of her students won it this year, Tahamba Jess, who also won the Gabonka. <laughs> so just to let you know, you don't know which one of these wonderful writers may be a Pulitzer Prize winner in the future. So that's what we have going on, and I'm very happy to be able to say it. Um, we have a fantastic list. We're going to be doing things a little bit differently. And before we get started, I wanted to introduce Nora Brooks Blakely. She was the producing artist, um, artistic director and primary playwright for Chocolate Chips Theater Company in Chicago for 29 years. Her readings and lectures have been conducted in several states. Mrs. Blakely taught, I mean, Ms. Blakely taught for eight years in Chicago public schools and spent over 20 years teaching drama and writing workshops for students and teachers. Nora has also served on boards and committees, several youth arts organizations. She is the daughter of two writers, Henry Blakely and Gwendolyn Brooks. She founded the Brooks Permissions Com a Company that manages her mother's body of work and promotes its continued relevance in the 21st century. And she is happy to share Seasons, uh, Gwendolyn Brooks, oops, is it anthology? 
experience and didn't have it on him. Yes, come on up, Nora. <laughs> Okay, so half blinded by one light and not enough light right over here. So, but we're gonna work with this. Uh, <laughs> so uh, every year I'm very excited about this event, which is unusual for me because bluntly speaking, I am not always excited by open mic programs. <laughs> some are really good and some are interesting. So, um, uh, this is, but I'll be brief because this is the part of the evening where brevity, brevity is important. Uh, everybody's interested and excited about getting to the, to the um, pieces that we're looking forward to hearing. And later on, there will be a piece where I can, a space where I can talk a little bit longer because it's the burn time while people are scrambling to get all those numbers and everything together. So we might have to stretch. So in that time, however, before that, right now, I thought that this would be the perfect opportunity <clears throat> in seasons of Gwendolyn Brooks' experience, uh, co-edited by, co by myself and also Cynthia Walls, who's the vice president of Brooks Permissions. So, okay, wave. Thank you. <laughs> And, uh, and by the incredible artistry, the illustrations by Jan Spivey Gilchrist. Uh, but there are also other things besides uh, thematic collections of my mother's poetry in here. And one of the things is in 1980, she wrote uh, a little book called Young Poets Primer. And it was writing tips. And it's really not just writing tips for young people. It is a collection that many people who have been writing for a long time said that it still helped them. And it was out of print, so we put the whole thing in here. And I thought that there was never a better time to quote some of the writing tips than at this. So here are two very short writing tips. One, number 25 about readers. Now and again, I meet a poet who assures me I write for myself, not for other people. What about writing for self as opposed to writing for self and others? Answer, if you show your work only to yourself, always, you are one of the few individuals truly self-concerned and only self-concerned writing for self alone. It is a thin business with cold rewards. <laughs> so, and the, the other number, where did number seven go? There's number seven. Don't use pretty words just because they're pretty. Don't use thousand dollar words just because they are expensive. Your words, your phrases, your punctuation, all must prove they have specific jobs to do for you. Jobs that drive you inexorably toward your resolution. And for those of you who have read my mother's work, you know just how committed she was to those words. So now we're going to move forward. And our next person on the program, you're going to do that? So let me give you back to Tony, who can tell you what the next thing is. Thank you. <laughs> All righty, so there is this device that people have on them that is so incredibly rude. So I would like for all of you to take yours out and just make sure that it's turned off because if it's not, then the poet has to start again if it rings while that poet is reading and you will have to leave. I know, I was so nice the other years and people still kept messing up. And so now I'm dropping the hammer. Do we all have an understanding? Thank you. I'm waiting. I want to make sure that everyone has taken out their phone and turned it off. Raise your hand when you are done. Can you tell I taught for many years? All righty. Some people didn't raise their hand, so I'm still waiting. 
All righty, are we good now? Okay. Yes. So how many of you all have been to a Gwendolyn Brooks Open Mic Award before? So for those of you who have, you will notice a little bit of difference going on tonight. We actually have an alternate round. And so we have three poets that are gonna come up and they're gonna perform. Whoever wins that round will then be performing for the you know, actual real round one. Um, and so we would like to do this. It's also how we're gonna like also test the waters with this whole situation of voting. Uh, does everyone have a ballot? So we should get ballots out. Okay. Lisa is going to explain how we're going to make this work. Everybody is getting a packet of six ballots. You get to vote on a poet in each round. So if you don't have one that says alternate route, round one, round two, round three, round four, and round five, then I owe you some paper. Does that? Well, the poets don't get to vote. I'm so sorry. Who needs ballots then? Fabulous. Thank you, Tony. So while we're passing out those um, those ballots, I'd like to tell you about when I won in 2005. I was dead dog broke. Uh, <laughs> are you a poet over here? We're, the poets aren't going to be voting this time. I said, you're not voting. That's why I pointed because they were raising their hands over there. Exactly. You have enough to worry about. We aren't going to have you voting. And so anyway, so I won and I had that $500. Are you a poet? Right. <laughs> so I'm telling you. So I get this card for $500, because that's what I had won, because I needed to get to Marilyn Nelson's Soul Mountain Retreat. Now, I was very lucky that this $500 car actually made it all the way to Connecticut and back. Yay. But it kept going and going and going. So then I drove it to DC, and then I drove it to Boston, and then I drove it to New Orleans. And when I drove it back to DC, it died. <laughs> but it was Christmas time, so I just took the bus back on the, you know, back home. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll get another car when I get to Chicago. And on that bus ride, I met a young man from Benin. And a year later, we were married. <laughs> right? Who would think? Who would think? And then uh, I was told many, many, many years ago that I couldn't have children. And then a year after that, I had a kid. So I kind of feel like Gwendolyn Brooks was just like, yo, I got all this greatness for you if you just get your writing together. <laughs> so that's my little way of saying, even if it doesn't work out this year where you, you know, get all the dreams that you want, keep on doing it. Because you never know. Something groovy, wonderful, and amazing is just waiting for you all the time as a writer. <laughs> Are we ready? Does everyone have a, have a ballot? Mark Turcott. I'm going to sit up here and fill this space moment. So here we go. Big Daddy won, won the first, the original, the like unbelievably starting. Come on, I'm giving you some time to stand up and walk down here. I know, that's why I'm trying to give you like the most amazing, you know, little things about who you are. So Mark Turcott, amazing writer, teacher, and just glorious human being, won the first Gwendolyn Brooks Open Mic Award. How many poets were reading that night? 88. <laughs> it's hard enough when it's just, you know, 20. Oh my God. And where was it? 1994. And where was it? Right when it was on Milwaukee, right? Not, not, see, by the time I got to Chicago, the hot house was downtown in the loop, sitting up there hanging out. And so you won. Just to correct, Ms. Brooks was in the audience all night. And after that, afterwards, she came up and gave me an envelope with five $100 bills. It was not a check. Oh, not a check. It was the actual cash. Oh, my goodness.
Do you have, did you, were, were we able to get the last, was it, we had six people back there who didn't get ballots? I'll get them. All the way in the back. Thanks for making me the filler. <laughs> I'm, I'm about to get, go to my other old standby. Where's Mike Q again? <laughs> ah, there you are, Mike. And since you're right here, uh, uh, Turcotte couldn't come all the way up, but you can make it around. So this is one of my all-time favorite stories as well of a Gwendolyn Brooks open mic award, or reading. <laughs> so you're not the only filler, Mark. <laughs> so um, in the early days, there were, as many people in this audience, there were readers. <laughs> and uh, people would come up one after another after another, and they'd, they'd uh, uh, read their poems. Now, I competed a couple times, but, uh, and in all of these, Gwendolyn Brooks was in the audience. Nora, I think, was right next to her the whole time. They never left. Uh, three hours of open mic poetry, one right after another. All right. <laughs> I was one of them. So my name was called, got up to the uh, mic, I read my poem, sat down, the next person came up. And so I'm, I'm still got adrenaline running, I'm listening, not really listening, because I'm, I'm still got a, adrenaline running. And somebody tapped me on my shoulder and said, this is from Gwendolyn. And I opened up, and it was a note from her. Well, I did not win the $500 that, that night, but I got something that has nourished me since then much more than uh, $500 would, would have ever, because it'd be gone, long gone. But I opened it up, and it said, you are unique and splendid, Gwendolyn. It's on my wall right now. <laughs> I need to see it every day. But that's what she did. She, she funded people, and she, she encouraged people. And it's the reason we're here today, 24 years later. So good luck to everyone here. This is going to be a great night. All right, now does everybody have a ballot so we can get started with this first round? So we're going to do the alternate round. It should have three names on that ballot. Do you have it? OK, so I have Shakira, Natasha, and Chuck. Where are my three? Let's have you hosting. So I want you to stand in, uh, over here. Shakira, one. Natasha, when she's done, then you'll be on deck. Oh, not yet. And then when Natasha's done, then you can go on deck. And so that way you don't have to, because I, I don't want you to miss seeing them do their poetry. All righty, so here we go. Sh the first round of Shakira. I'm sorry, when you're voting, um, Lisa, would you like for them to circle the name? I think it makes it a lot easier. All right, so I want you to circle the name of the, the one that you would like to win for that round. And so right now, we have Shakira. All right, hi, I'm Shakira Calluet. My poem is called My Prayer. <clears throat> Lord, make me white. My hair the color of straw and hay. Let it not kink up in the naps in my kitchen. Bless me until the snow white stereotype of blonde hair and blue eyes with a petite frame that would make Hitler proud. Lord, hear me. Erase the shame of slavery from my ancestry. Make me 1 16th Cherokee, 3 fourths Irish, 1 18th German, and 0 out of 0 black. Christ of Nazareth, hear my sincere plea. This is not what you wanted me to be. Amen. Verse 2, God. Baby. I made your hair strong like cotton so you can carry the burdens when your journey got rough and weary. Baby, there is beauty in the struggle. Without the pain, how would you know my love? 
I made you from desert sand and clay. You are the color of my sun. You stand on the shoulders of Malcolm, Martin, Zora, and Maya. I birthed you in my name and blessed you in my name. Your hips carry rhythms from continent to continent. You are mine and mine alone. You will always, always come back to me, even if you stray, even if I have to break your legs in four different You are blessed in my name, and you will never be the same. Salah. Thank you. Natasha. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Natasha Estevez, and this is Big Belly Daddies Need Love Too. Hola, papi. Yo sé que tú nos quieres mucho y que la vida no te ha tratado tan amable, pero te veo y te entiendo y te amo. Espero que un día sea feliz. Three missed calls from Big Belly Daddies. Ignore, ignore, ignore. Sorry, Daddy, I was sleeping. Note to self. Maybe talking over the phone doesn't work for us. Can you write me a letter? I'll write one back to you. A letter for my big belly daddy. Forgive me, because every time you call, it seems that I'm sad. At times, I am, but most of the time, I'm happy. A present from daddy's paycheck, right back to him. En el nombre de Jesús, amen. God solves all problems. Sundays were supposed to be dedicated to him. They were supposed to. We gave him praise, then dismissed him quickly for TV, dreams, and problems, for mommy's ensalada de papa, for an afternoon with papi watching IFC. Jars, they were important, still are. When we were hungry, we would reach inside, buy something, reach inside, grab what it had for the day, fed mouths, bojabon de cuava, toothpaste, y jabón de lavarropa. Bodega, Big Belly Daddy's quick run. Galleticas, media libra de salami, media libra de queso frito, papitas, juguitos, cookies, candy, helado. La movies. Man, oh man, oh man. We loved our movie theater. We went there even when we couldn't afford it. We all sat together, had our eyes glued to the big, big, big TV while eating nachos, hot dogs, fruit punch, and crunch candy. This is why we dress nice, to go to la movies together. Then we go home. Big belly daddies love photos. When the sun goes down and the kids go back home to mommy, that's all they've got. They hold it and they cry. Don Francisco plays loud on the TV while they cry into their big hands, hands that have worked in parking lots. And they are careful with their sobs because they live in rented rooms and their compadre lives in the living room. Big belly daddies are illegal. They are doing the best that they can and still find a way to give us what we want. You are gonna be a superstar. That's what he told me. Big belly daddies never got to be superstars. Thank you. And Chuck.
Thank you. I'm Chuck Kramer, and uh, I would like to thank Nora and Lisa and Mike and all the people who make uh, the Guild uh, possible and keep it going. It's great to be here and to read Dancing with Shadows for you. The day nearly done, I go in the house and climb the stairs to the second floor. I sit at the window and watch darkness fall across the lawn, obscuring my limited view as the occasional car glides past, carrying people to distant streets and unknown scenes where I will be the missing element. But I'm not alone. The house alive with people moving in the kitchen below, the air rich with the aroma of roasting meat, the TV laughing mechanically in the family room. I light the old candle that once stood on my mother's dresser, and the room is filled with skeletal shadows. I watch them dart and dive, straining to hear the whispers curling their lips, but I can't make out what they're saying. They're garbled, murmuring, impossible to understand. I avert my eyes when the boatman pulls past the window with an icy stare, knowing I will soon be his passenger, and though resigned, I'm disappointed. I will leave behind so much undone. I go up to the attic and rummage through the discards of the past, a tangled ball of days which hides its secrets in a web of stubborn silence. When I stand to go, I bang my head on the low ceiling in the tight, cramped space of my own limitations and infirmities, choking on the stale, dusty air as I realize there are no answers. And like anyone else with cold, bony fingers on his shoulder, I'm alone in this murky light at the end of the day. I step out on the roof and raise my face to the moon. I rise and float through the thin, vaporous clouds of my youthful dreams. The horizon clears as I near a shimmering star which looks like a door opening on a warm room filled with laughter. I enter hoping I've arrived at a new destination, but worried this might be the final departure as I step in and the door, the door closes behind me. Ooh, y'all have a hard job. <laughs> People have tried over the years to get to give me some ballots, and I say, no, I don't, I don't like to vote at all. Mm -hmm. Can't do it. So what we're going to do, do we have everybody lined up on this side, ready to take your, your ballots? We're going to pass them all down to the right. I'm sorry, to your left. <laughs> when they're all passed uh, over, let me know. We have them being picked up. Round one, you will circle the names, either Shakira Kaluet, Natasha Estevez, or Chuck Kramer.
Jazz and Beyond. So we have um, our first um, voting done. And our alternate poet choice is Natasha Estevez. So the way that this is going to go down is, because you've heard Natasha's poem already, we feel that it wouldn't be appropriate for her to read again for this round. So keep that in mind. You would circle alternate poet choice if you would like for her to win, and win this round, and then if not, we have the other ones here. So next up, we're gonna have the four um, other poets for round one that are listed. Robert Lawrence, Cassandra McGovern, Stasa or Stacia? Stasa. Stasa, thank you. Stasa Wade and Eric Allen Yankee. So we'll start off this round with Robert Lawrence. Hi, I am Bob Lawrence, and my uh, poem is Who Remembers the Most? Someone I won't know once said, People who are forgotten remember the most. The forgotten, those slighted by others, the perpetually uninvited, the oddballs, the loners, 500 solo old people curling up in a summer heat wave, street walkers and street people, junkies in the bedlam bound, all dancing on the margins of the forgetful city, acutely remembering their slight. But do they remember more than I do? The eye of the poet consumes the past like a holy fire. I remember the dream, my mother and me on the elevated platform in the Bronx. She grabs my hand and we jump. I remember picking all the wild strawberries in the vacant lot down the block and feeling guilty I hadn't left any. I remember my aunt perched on the windowsill of her seventh floor, Brooklyn apartment, threatening with the high-pitched, warbling voice of hysteria, I'll jump! I remember my mother, bluer than blue, copying Donald Duck cartoons and asking me, do I have artistic talent, Bobby? I remember my father turning my old bedroom into a brewery. I remember the wine-like taste of the beer. I remember him putting on a lock on the door so my mother couldn't get in and drink herself into homemade oblivion. I remember the bad trip. Walls of a room turning into wax, rippling in bright, colorful waves, while a stereo playing the stones behind the wall became visible to me. I remember descending through this cubist space into an insomniac cycle of elation and paranoia and winding up in an observation ward for the variously tormented, where, seeing Mr. Pope, an elderly black man, play his poker hand with complete concentration, I realize with gut-level certainty that all men are indeed created equal. I remember sneaking a tube of liver sausage into a Hindu nunnery for my first wife, who had left me for God. I remember my second wife screaming how much she loved me, then forgetting the next morning. I remember my first son burning with undiagnosed fever. I remember standing in the shower, muttering, take me, but leave the kid alone. I remember my second son's night terrors, talking simultaneously to us and to the creatures of his dreams. I remember my son playing his own jazz song of such ineffable beauty that I thought, yes, I am going to die someday, but that's okay. And I remember speaking the words of my poems, people listening, I remember most. People won't forget me, will they? Cassandra McGovern. Hello. My name's, oh, you just said Cassandra McGovern. <laughs> My poem is entitled Golden Lotus. Mama soaked my feet in herbs mixed with animal blood. She whispered, feet softer, then curled my toes under and pressed hard until they broke. 
At five, my feet were bound tight while I wailed with pain, blood droplets seeping through cotton cloth. I sobbed, why, Mama, why have you hurt me? She smiled. I felt her tears drop on my face. A matchmaker found a rich husband when I turned 16. I did not see him until our wedding. We both wore long red gowns. At dusk in our wedding chamber, I poured tea, read poems I composed. He gently lifted my dress over my head, caressing my body. As I sat on a low chair, he removed my red wedding slippers, gazed at my feet, lifted each one to his lips, kissing the large toe, then carried me to our carved canopy bed. When he released curtain pullbacks holding lace drapes to each side, they swung lazily in front of us, the strings now loosely tied round my ankles. Fizzling firecrackers, banging drums, tootling flutes, clanging cymbals all clamored toward our room, festival family serenading us. My only child a girl, no son, he yelled, then took second wife. She bore two sons, all favored by my in-laws. How are girls so disliked when boys deify their mothers? They were once girls like Hui, my lotus flower. How I wished my Lao Tung, my kindred sister, could visit. I feel lonely, an outcast. Hui could be friends with her daughter, her secret sister. My mother-in-law commanded me to have no contact with her for the rest of my life. My husband comes to my room when he needs erotic pleasures watches me walk in light steps when he calls me to him, lingers as he slips off my shoes, the only toe unbroken, my largest, the others wrapped under it to fit in four-inch long satin shoes. I could not help with chair, chores, could not run and play with Hui or honorable second wife's two boys, only good for sex, for delight, my shoes and me. No mention of our daughter, does he think of her at all? Occasionally, he brings a new pair of shoes, places them on my bed, fills a large basin with orange roses afloat in warm water, washes my feet, traces with his tongue how the other toes fold so well underneath, nearly embedded into each sole. He kisses each foot, gently tucks them in elfin slippers while his breath quickens and he swoops me to the bed. Last week, he stayed long nights, presenting on the second of three evenings a black velvet pair lined in crimson tiny rosebud flowers embroidered in purples, blues, and yellows, cascading on each side down to pointed tips. How fine and lovely you are, Fan. Your mother did rare and delicate work for me. Stay so wait. I'm Stasa. Uh, this is called Ebonics. That's ghetto. No, 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 no. I mean that's ghetto with a capital G. Not the lowercase way you say it. When you say it, it sounds dirty and scary and sharp like a bus stop steak knife. Like, whoa, that does not belong here. Wonder how it got here. Wonder what it's been through. Definitely do not pick it up. Matter of fact, stop looking at it. It's ghetto. That's how you say ghetto. Me? I'm a capital G queen. I say it clean like my edges laid by God himself. I say it sweet like Kool-Aid, not your Kool-Aid, your Kool-Aid tastes like dishwater. <laughs> I say it sour like lemon salt we save our quarters for at the corner store. They both make my mouth pucker. I taste both in the back of my throat. They make me drool. Ghetto is that hood rich feeling after you get your check but before rent is due. Parlaying the roach weed to a blunt. Windows down in the hoop de bumping that thing, that thing, that thing. God bless Lauren Hill. Weave so long, it swishes around your ass. Weave so bright, they see you coming from down the block. Like, who is she? My ghetto is rhythm. It sways and bops in time with bare feet on concrete and double dutch and thick lips and thick hips. It two, two steps even on the hard days and we're never short on hard days. I say it loud from a big mouth. I say it loud, I'm reclaiming words. I'm reclaiming space. I'm on the north side with my doves up, screaming long live the west side. They taught me everything good about ghetto.
Eric Allen Yankin. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I'm Eric Allen Yankee, and this piece is Hands Off. Hands off, Korea, shouts the man as he thrusts a sheet of his soul at me. I admire him for standing on this corner and protesting war for hours each day. Will Congress hear him from Fullerton Avenue? Not likely, but still. He will remain here and stand against the coming war. A girl walks by on crutches. She is the United States, or what's left of it. She's an image of a place that believes it once stood for something. Now it's all broken legs and battering rams, bigger bombs than Corso could imagine, and a sense of terror that grows every day. This place is afraid to face itself. It will not stand for hours on a corner to fight unjust war. It will just build bigger bombs and break more legs. Thank you. Y'all got some work to do. So just remember your first poet is Natasha Estevez. <laughs> Bob Lawrence, or Robert, since it's written down here, I'm gonna say your name. <laughs> Cassandra McGovern, Stacey Wade, and Eric Allen Yankee. Make your choices, pass them to your left, and we'll join you right for the next round. How many of y'all had heard of the Guild Complex before this evening? So for those of you who haven't, and even for those of you who have and you haven't hung out with us for a little bit, know that the Guild Complex was created for you, writers and uh, people who love writing in Chicago. It used to be a bookstore back in the day, and if you had a professor that was teaching and you wanted to check out their writing, it had every professor's book in the city. I thought that was like an amazing bookstore. I wish I was here for that bit. And then we were over at the, um, the Chopin Theater for our events. And we'd bring in poets and musicians all over, from all over the world and just hang out and have a great time getting inspired to write. And now we are here with this. We also have, um, as, what is our Luna? Um, the, the writer series, Palabra Luna. Porta, thank you. I was like, that can't be Luna. I'm thinking about Luna Blues Machine, which I would love for you all to have at the Guild Complex one day. I think that maybe that's why I said it, so I could actually get that in there. So since 1989, the Guild Literary Complex has served the Chicago community through innovative programming that highlights the intersections of marginality, the power of community, which is what you all are here tonight, and the impact of arts and activism, which we also hear in the words of our poets tonight as well. We build unapologetically on Chicago's rich literary traditions through vibrant storytelling and radical inclusion. This is actually the first place that I ever worked in Chicago. I came, I moved here from Boston because that's the only thing you should do whenever you live there. And I didn't say that. I don't say that out loud. I don't know why you're just laughing at the things that are in my head. So, but yes, yeah, so I moved here October 8th, the anniversary of the, uh, of the Chicago fire. Um, the executive uh, director at the time, Ellen Placey Wadey, uh, had to guide me across the street because I don't know if you know, we were used to be in this little place on um, Ashland, Milwaukee, and what is the other terrifying street? It was like the uh, division. Yeah, and so I'm like trying to figure out where she is because I see the Guild Complex on the Chopin Theater, but we weren't there, we were crossing. And so I'm running, I've got heels on, which I should never do. And then uh, I make it and uh, she's like, yeah, you got the job, it's okay, it's, it's okay, just calm down. And so I've been here ever since because of the Guild Complex. I thought I was only gonna stay in Chicago for two years. It's been 15. <laughs> Do we have all of the ballots in? Who do we need? There we go. I'm gonna make sure they're all counted up. 
and we're good with everyone else, no more ballots out, then let's start round two. Oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Nicole. So we do have Nicole Bond who won last year, 2016, and now she's going to do a reading for us, which is awesome, and then while we count up the ballots. So come on up, Nicole Bond. Thank you, Miss Tony. Hi, poets, friends, family. Good to see you guys. Congratulations to you all. It's amazing to be here for all of you. It's amazing for me. I've enjoyed being able to say this whole year, I won the 2016 Gaboma. And I am grateful that one of you will be able to say you won the 2017. So congratulations. This is the poem that won for me last year. It's called Crossing the Desert. Sunlight shines through the window on her plastic Aldi bag. Facing front, moving forward, traveling backwards into canned quicksand. Behind her stands a man at the door. His, his plastic Save-A-Lot bags on the floor parked between black lace Nikes. Sitting across from them both, I got a plastic bag too. Mine more upscale got upsailed, no drawstring. Black and white pictured for all to see Santa Maria della Pace, Roman church where no man is a treasure island. Roman streets filling seats on this bus, all of us riding back to the desert where no food is grown, no food is sold, except day old donuts and double D cups from behind bulletproof glass inside the same place you can buy gas. Nourishment goes, Flaming hot Cheetos extinguished by turquoise water, syrupy sweet inside toxic plastic bottles tossed by the wayside, waist size ginormous, hail damaged asses, sausage cased into spandex and lace, spilling across two and a half priority seats, morbidly obese, yet horribly malnourished. Diabetes is a peace treaty for population control, survival of the fittest. Don't you see this? He'll get a kidney. You'll get dialysis. Some get apples, others get the serpent. Thank you. I love this night. Thank you all so much for being so wonderful. For round two, we have Shante Luna, Andrew Gregory Kazak, Hannah Contafio, is it Contafio? Contafio. Jane Hsu, Shu, and Bianca Lisa Arajo. Arajo? Okay. Shante Luna. After binge watching Twilight Zone, the monsters are no longer on Maple Street, but on Pennsylvania Avenue. And they treat it like the invaders they are, lacking reason, logic, and moral compass. Their faces like masks that can't be removed. If beauty is in the eye of the beholder, then scrutiny should be as well. The monsters are in the fever between power and greed, wealth and mass ruin. We've arrived upon the era of the midnight sun. This burden curtain of despair covers us and can be seen from other parts of the world. The clock of progress has stopped at Willoughby and froze. An arrow was shot into the air and has yet to return for the righteous road is much farther than walking distance, much farther than all the steps to cross the Nevada desert. The monster sees himself in the mirror and turns, not seeing his own reflection lunging for the back of his neck. There is no going back, for the road before, faith and hope has disappeared, and in its place, 
the path paved in purple testament, where we must destroy all mirrors so that we may not see our own reflection. A great nation will be one where every single person is taken care of. The dream of America should be for everyone living in it, not just the select few that are wealthy and privileged. Time to break the silence and drive out the narcissistic tyrant. Our ancestors are watching and waiting for us to drive him out and have time enough at last. Andrew Gregory Cazette. Thank you. <clears throat> Apologize for the voice. I'll read it lower. Um, thanks to the Guild. Um, I appreciate it. Um, fellow poets, you guys are killing it. Thank you. And thanks for the audience. It's helpful to know before I start that um, outside of, hmm? thank you. Fort Sumner, New Mexico is um, the grave of Billy the Kid whose uh, real name was William H. Bonney. He's buried with two uh, of his gang, and they're all together, and it says pals underneath. That said, that's the cliff notes. Let's go. Like bats and outlaws, Santa Fe to New Mexico, Albuquerque, a long time ago. We drop and spiral, spiral and flutter like bats from a cave at dusk, each driven by a certain hunger, each blood with its own frequency. But my blood is your blood, and I do not have to look to know where you are. We are the ghosts of Bonnie, of Bowdry, and O'Folliard, pals, our violence cooled in the midnight of the desert air. Our bones awake, alive and dancing through the waves of the wind. Fire melting metal. Time melting days. Love melting anger. Driving across counties, across paved history, across paved nature. Tomorrow's losses, breathing now for us. Driving towards Albuquerque, driving towards the morning and all that it will hold down beneath it in the heat. Tonight gallops into legend, like the romance of outlaws. As we sleep in the air, stomachs full, unaware of which way is up like bats and hold each other always with our laughter and with our blood like siblings. Thanks. Cantafio? Cantafio. And just make sure you adjust. Hello, my name is Hannah. This is The Cure. Midnight on a Wednesday in the heat of July, I swallowed a little beetle that an old woman had soaked in something I could, I could not pronounce. At night, I would writhe around on pure white sheets, thinking only of the little bug that grew in my stomach. I could swallow nothing but breath, but I did not count a thing besides the hours. The old woman crushed a dried leaf and placed the crumbs under my tongue, and I was happy. I was real. I slept in beds with pressed sheets, ate like a queen at tables with royal subjects, and I never counted anything. Until one morning, I woke with pox and pinpricks, and my lips and tongue had grown just like the little bug. The old woman removed the leaves from under my plush tongue while I screamed and writhed in pure white sheets. I begged her to leave them, for I was not tapping the spots that lined my legs that no longer had purple kisses up and down and down and up. I am cured. 
The old woman scraped away the leaves despite my desperate cries. There is no cure. The bottoms of my feet were beginning to itch. This is who you are. She handed me a pebble and I swallowed it without water, and I ran so I could no longer feel the pox and pinpricks lining my soles. I was bleeding when I jumped, up and up, grabbing at pure white sheets that were whipping in the wind. The seams wrapped around my neck like a wedding dress that was not mine. You can be happy without being cured. What are you playing with? The cold water I plunged into shocked my bones into working again. The joints in my fingers were tapping again. I began to cry softly as I swam to the shore, the salt and fresh mixing into brackish, blackish liquid that reflected the moon in my skin. When I got to the dock, the old woman was waiting with a pretty pink pill sitting in her palm. Who will you be without it? I will be happy. I will be real. But will you? I had no response but to swallow the pill. Thank you. Jane Shu. I know I'm not supposed to tell you what the poem is about. I'm sure that's like the cardinal sin. But I wanted to give you a little context. So I'm an English professor at Dominican University outside Chicago. A few years ago, I was on maternity leave for my first and only child, trying to earn tenure. I also, and then I jump, I also deal with clinical depression and anxiety, and my father was hospitalized several times for bipolar disorder when I was growing up. And this is called Doing the Dishes. On maternity leave for my first and only child, writing an article to enhance my tenure file, child in daycare while I write. Every day, I need to do the dishes. Life with a newborn, copious bottles, rings, and caps. Some days, the dishes are loaded neatly and efficiently in the dishwasher. The sink and counters are sparkling clean. Everything is in order for when baby and papa get home. Sometimes it is just one item on my checklist to do. Other days, I wait until the last minute to do the dishes. The baby's bottles are hastily rinsed. Pieces of food remain in the sink strainer. Nights, the dishes left undone Plates unsteadily balanced, clinging to the lip of the sink. Cups and crumpled napkins, taking up valuable counter space. Days, the depression and anxiety limit my activities. It is difficult to concentrate. Dishes are an exercise in discipline and practice. One thing and the next. The water and suds on my, ha on my bare hands are my palpable graspable reality. My father said of his psychiatric hospital stays for bipolar disorder, sometimes you just need to do the dishes. A, <laughs> um, a measured function. Doing the dishes is a rhythm and a structure, a circle. I have a PhD. I will be a tenured professor soon. I still measure my worth by doing the dishes. Bianca Lisa Arujo. Strong. I think my legs are not soft, hard instead. The base of a mountain, my shoulders tower high above the ground, my heart in the clouds. 
but my head higher. In the chill of the thin air, the clear, blinding light of the sun, my arms at either side ready to defend my core. Avalanches, a sail, rock slides, ravage, but my arms push against them, and I am still once more unmovable. My back, shard upon shard, one piece indiscernible from the next before the cracks and fissures. My hands grasp tightly at any life that forms on me. I am a hostile environment. Sometimes there are trees too stubborn to grow anywhere else. But not for long. I am strong, I think, but you are an earthquake. And I have come to realize that I am a volcano. Eruptions send tremors through my base, draw lava from my lips, down my shoulders, which tower high above the ground. They erode from the heat, then are reformed igneous and defiant. My head is engulfed in smoke, the blaze coming from the ardor of my heart. My arms have no defense against an earthquake. My feelings shock you. You assault my core from within. Do not expect a volcano to apologize for the inevitable. My back trembles and threatens to fall apart, fault lines Convulse, but shard upon shard are instead welded together. You pulverize stone, create sand that my hands try to grasp tightly, slips through my fingers. So I learn to be softer, less hostile. I am made of rock still but your power overwhelms mine, transforms me, forges me also in fire, reveals me to the world. I was strong, now I am stronger. Thank you. Every round gets higher and higher. So you will circle your choices, send them over to the left. And we have Shante Luna that started us off, Andrew Gregory Kazak, Hannah Cantafio. Yeah. Was that it? Cantafio. Cantafio. I'm really not from like anywhere near Midwest, and that's that little short A that y'all do that I just don't get. So I'm really trying to do be better. Um, James Shu and Bianca Lisa Arajo. Arajo? Arajo. So how many of you all have ever said a Gwendolyn Brooks poem out loud? Good. The rest of y'all will have your first time tonight. So when I was eight years old, I was on a bus and I looked up and they had We Real Cool. And it was a great little like picture that was done on the side. And then I read it, because I was eight and I just learned how to read. And so I looked at my mom, I said, mommy, I want to do that. And she's like, what? I was like, create a story in 24 words. And she's like, oh, you can count too. <laughs> So here we go. How many of you all know the poem, Re Real Cool? And if not, for those of you who don't, solid. We're going to do this as call and response, because we've colored tonight. I know. Here we go. So it's going to do We Real Cool the way that Gwendolyn Brooks would have said it, because she wrote this poem specifically so that you would understand that you were in this week. They are not they. They are not the ones just in the pool hall. We all, we all hold these words in our mouth. So this is called We Real Cool, The Pool Players 7. 
at the golden shovel. So I'm gonna say the first line and you're gonna say it just like I do. This is my favorite part. We, real cool we. We, real cool we. Left school we. Left school we. Learn late we. Strike straight, we. Strike straight, we. Sing sin, we. Sing sin, we. Thin gin, we. Thin gin, we. Jazz June, we. Jazz June, we. Die soon. Thank you. So in the morning, you can wake up and say, that was nice to have Gwendolyn Brooks's words in my mouth. Have all the ballots been passed in, ladies? You got your job there, Mr. Pugin. <laughs> you have what, Nora? <laughs> The poet's daughter gonna sit up here and, and hold up the time. <laughs> She's the queen. So here we go. We're gonna start off with round three. We were gonna have Erica Foreman, who's the judge for this year's competition. Unfortunately, she is unable to be in attendance tonight. Um, and so we will continue now to round three. All of the ballots have been turned in, right? One, okay. Uh, Who's with the, Nicole, can you do me a favor and run this back? I want to make sure that they all get back in there. I know you don't have on the shoes. I'm sorry, sweetie, but those are real cute. <laughs> Round three, I've got Marjorie Skelly, Apple Rhodes Gunter, or Gunther, Herschel, I'm sorry, Sam Herschel Wayne or Ween? Wine. Wine, my favorite thing. <laughs> don't be forgetting that one. Um, let's see, Tarn Young? Hmm? Tarn Young? Onya Wonya. Onu Monu. Onu Monu. I'm sorry, I'm gonna get it right. And then H Melt. I'm sorry, I like that name too. This is like my favorite round for names. So here we go, we have final, uh, this is the semifinal round three. Starting us off will be Marjorie Skelly. Do I have a word from uh, Lisa Wagner? Oh, no, it's oh. 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 Sorry, go ahead, Marjorie Skelly. <laughs> Thank you to everybody who made tonight possible, and including all of us poets. And I wish that my daughter could be here tonight because this poem would not have been possible without her. The title of the poem is Peonies. And my daughter is now 28 years old, but in the poem, she's 21 years old. The gift of this May evening slips back in time to one fragrant moment when I can believe, daughter, that like you, I am 21, falling in love at first sight with a young man who now walks through our front door, striking good looks, sincerity when he asks if I need help carrying wine glasses to the porch, where the accommodating evening casts those who need it into pretend youth. May moon not yet ripened, Pinot Grigio catching candlelight, an evening when I slip generously into a former night as if into an expensive gown, bought, not borrowed. Even in my borrowed youth, I see you talking with him in your here and now of slender, sought after. Later, alone, the night older, 
I still have this young thought in the silence of midnight and budding trees when I bend with still youthful grace to smell the peonies in their finest shocking magenta hour filled with their deception of eternal blossoming. Their kernel unchaperoned rising from earth still touches me and I for now pressed into clothing, will soon fall into deep, ageless sleep and dream of that woman who lifts Earth's scent to wear its perfume. Thank you. Apple Rhodes Gunther. Greetings. Since when did I become a matriarch? I mean, with all due respect to whoever is out there that, to the, con to the, to the universe, to convention, to whoever's out there that may care, or better yet, may disagree or be offended by my ramblings, when did I become an institution? Please, I am just an old hippie. Really, peace, love, and leave me the fuck alone. That's always been my mantra. I wasn't down for all this responsibility. OK, I guess the cycle had something to do with it. No, baby, not the menstrual cycle. The born, live, age, die cycle. And I'm only up to the early age part, BTW. I want to know at what point did I cross that line? What line do you ask? Well, on the one side, you're a hot chick, or maybe semi-hot, and on the other, you're always available. You're reliable. You're a loan officer. You're a doctor. You're a social worker. And you're a chauffeur. How did this old hippie chick get there? And no, don't blame it on the hash brownies. <laughs> I have given this extensive thought. I've even meditated on it when I do that yoga. And I've concluded that even though I thought I had a plan, a direction. I just allowed myself to get swept along. Four marriages, three births. I lost count of the deaths. And the day-to-day -day tedium, the day-to-day -day wonder. I really was not the master of my fate. And of course, there is that other dance. The one that involves begetting, you know, like in the Bible, Old Testament style. Lots of begetting. Not a lot of fruit, but enough. Till one day, in the blink of an eye, without much thought or planning or effort, here I am, Big Mama. Sam Herschel Wine. Instagram photo, hoop earring. My mother listing out loud, not on a sheet of napkin or envelope. Usually it's grocery lists, to-do lists, but Today, it's a list of all the gay men she knows, telling me after each of their names, and they don't wear lipstick. I've never seen them wear lipstick, not even one time. And she's referring to me, my supposed sin, the Instagram photo someone showed her where I had on a hoop earring purple lipstick. And I said to my mother, well, you see them during the daytime. 
at the lunch spot on or after work? Do you see them out late, dancing past 2 a.m.? See them slip and stumble, kissing strangers at the bus stop? And she shrugs only one of her shoulders, not to say she thinks I am right, but to say I have done something wrong and nothing I say will change that. But mother, what I wish I had said, what I have carried with me to the spice shop, the grocery store, on the shoulders where my bag rests as I bike home from his house late at night, was that, you know, mom, maybe I won't grow to be like the other gay men you know. And maybe when you tell me to resemble people I've never even met, I feel like a lumped laundry bag or tables of same colored hand towels. I'm trying to say that I am your son and only yours and only Sam with the loud chuckle and the clammy, nervous hands, and only Sam W at work because there are too many Sams for me to just be Sam, and there are too many gays for me to just be a gay, and there is a lot about me you won't confine in an eBay package as large as the table that I've spent too many years resisting the urge to listen when people tell me to be what doesn't feel like me, and will we have to talk about this again when I don't marry? Don't prioritize monogamy, paint nails blue for family brunch, wear a dress to the function, let my shoulder strap slip down my arm, showing off my overly hairy armpits, awkwardly long but few outer arm hairs. I'm eyeing bracelets at the checkout counter. I'm buying red rings with every dollar I have. Tarion Onomoto. Hi, everyone. Hi. Oh, oh, oh. I like this style right here. Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. Bear with me. Cool. Um, my name is Tayana Onomoto and this is called partner abuse. It's a spinning, spinning, motion, twisting, tautly, tightening tension. It's a can't, flee, draw, leash, retract all sweet intention. It's a not, noose, not, new, notoriously neglected. It's a slight, sight, subtle sign, I should come to expect this. I should come to reject this. But your light be bright, looming luminescence, the kind that leaves you breathless. Step away from the sun, Icarus, don't test this. I've come to slowly but surely ingest this. I tried to run but got snapped back. No eddy, this boomerang cycle death wish. I pray for death with every kiss. To escape this would be to languish in eternal bliss. This sweet absinthe, this poison piss. I lashed myself for seven years. What curse is this spinning, spinning, motion, twisting, tautly, tightening tension? Honey, you shrunk my love. Your shrink ray shrinks away my essence. In the eye of the storm, this magnetic field forlorn, I've tried to keep my distance. But your evil eye, a perverse sty, not seemingly life-threatening, but a bubbling under turns bubbling over as all your hatred festers and all my hatred festers. I nose dive into oblivion with no sense of self and no material wealth or worthy gain, though your accolades be drenched in my rouge pain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this love be sick nasty. This love be too taxing. Next up is H. Melt. Hey everyone, I'm H. Melt, and this is There Are Trans People Here After Jamal May. 
There are trans people here. So many trans people here is what I am trying to say. When they say we are all trapped in the wrong body, imposter, impossible, no. We are on the bus next to you, in the cubicle next to you, in the checkout line next to you. Some of us are sex workers, teachers, artists, nurses, homeless, unemployed, and hungry too. We are as real and complicated as anyone else. But they won't stop murdering, stop legislating, stop imprisoning, stop claiming we are ruining our countries, families, friendships, and futures too when every day we awaken to build them anew. So we have what we're supposed to be doing, right, Nora? I mean, now everybody. We're gonna be voting. Oh, I didn't say that out loud, did I? I don't know why y'all all up in my head. I'm not saying this out my mouth. So here we go, we're gonna vote for our wonderful poets. We're gonna vote for Marjorie Skelly, Apple Rose Gunther, Sam Herschel Wine, Tanamon Onomono, and H. Melt. Next up, the voice that you are going to hear is someone who changed my life in so many ways many, many years ago. I believe it was 1994. Uh, when Gwendolyn Brooks had received the, was it Thomas Jefferson Humanity Awards in D.C.? And I'm sitting there at the Kennedy Center and I'm looking at Gwendolyn Brooks and I'm going, oh my goodness, I'm a writer and I want to do that. And uh, Haki Matabudi was there that evening as well. And I had all kinds of like ovaries at the time and I handed him what I thought was a book of poetry that I had written. And of course, you know, you look back at things that you write 30 years ago, and you go, that was real crap. And he was so kind, <laughs> so kind and generous, actually read that mess, gave me advice on things instead of just like, well, throw it away and start again. And it's that because he was always a professor, always that, that, that teacher, and always that son of Gwendolyn Brooks. And her kindness was his, or is his. He's a leading poet in the art, a leading poet and one of the architects of the black arts movement. Hakeem Adabudi is publisher, editor, and educator. He's been a pivotal figure in the development of strong black literary traditions, of a strong black literary tradition. He has published more than 31 books, some under his for former name, Don L. Lee. Are you trying to not have me read your bio? <laughs> Do you know how amazing you are? Can I at least read this part? OK, thank you. If you see the humility of this brilliant and amazing man, it just, oh, OK. So anyway, the book that really changed my life was Black Men, Obsolete, Single, Dangerous, The African American Family in Transition, which came out in 1990 when I was in college. I gave it to everybody that I knew. And then Tough Notes, A Healing Call for Creating Exceptional Black Men. I'm sorry, these are things that touched me in such a way because there were so many times when people wanted to tell me that we should give up on black men and I had actual beautiful words that I could give to people and say no. I don't care what the media tells you. I don't care what five million people have written about whatever. I know them, they are my fathers, my children, my husband. They are my mentors. They are Haki Matabudi and we are all worthy of love and he has shown us why through his words. Um, that was very nice. Uh, Nora, how are you doing? Um, I'm here partially because of Gwendolyn Brooks. 
But we met in 1967. I was 25 and I published my first book, Think Black. I started Third World Press in my basement apartment in Inglewood, $400 in the mimograph machine. And I walked into that church on the south side of Chicago and Gwendolyn Brooks was at a, you know what a blackboard is? You know, the blackboard. And sitting around this table, all these young Blackstone Rangers. And she was teaching poetry, working with uh, Oscar Brown Jr. And uh, I like to say, when well, we showed up that Saturday morning, we, I and other poets from Obasi, Organization of Black American Writers Workshop, and I never left. And we're here because of her. And I've learned a great deal from Gwendolyn Brooks. And one of the things I learned from Gwendolyn Brooks is you always support the organizations that are supporting us. You gave me a check. Where's Lisa? Come on, get this check. Take this check back. <laughs> I read those 50 poems, and it was not to be paid for, OK? I want to congratulate all of you, even those of you who will not win tonight. But you did win because you're here, yes. and because she preceded all of us. And that's why we're here this evening. And for those who are in the first two rows, congratulations. And I want to invite you all out. Our Third World Press is celebrating 50 years uh, next week. <laughs> um, we're starting off on uh, Sunday, I'm sorry, um, this coming Saturday. With Tallahassee Coates, um, writer for Atlantic, as you know, one of the major uh, writers in the, the world now. And uh, he'll be with us Saturday at uh, the Logan Center about 5 o'clock. And then after that, I have a new CD coming out, Poetry with uh, the very bright, creative, genius Nicole Mitchell. And we're going to perform uh, that evening after Tallahassee Coates. And it would be a CD release. And the CD is Liberation Narratives. And then go to, just go to our website, uh, thirdworldpress.com. Uh, and you can find how it was happening. We'll get a whole week of people coming in here. And then, Nora, Gwen Brooks Night is what, Thursday or, or, or Wednesday? Uh, Wednesday the fourth? Wednesday. The fourth. So Wednesday, we have Gwen Brooks Night at, at uh, Betty Shabazz Academy. And we have a movie by, um, no, help me out. Who's the movie? Uh, Roy, Roy Lewis. But we have something you haven't seen. We have a presentation. I'm not going to tell you who's going to be there, but it's going to be music and reading of Gwilin and Rick's poetry along with Curtis Mayfield's work. I saw that. Oh, okay, we got it. <laughs> oh, I thought we were going to surprise it. But anyway, we, we got it. It's, it's, it's bad for you. So all you poets are invited out as our guests uh, that evening. Uh, and that's to be at uh, 7823 South Ellis, mm -hmm. right in the middle of the south side of Chicago at uh, Ben Shabazz Academy. So I'm going to read a poem. And I told Lisa something to tell you all. I'm going to have to leave after this. But I told Lisa to tell you all something after we finish up. And, uh, this poem was published in uh, the special edition of poetry for Gwendolyn and Brooks. And the poem is titled Gwendolyn and Brooks, America in Winter Time. Thank you all for that warm uh, introduction. <laughs> in this moment of orangutans, wolves, and scavengers, in high heat, redesigning the North and South Poles, and the wanderings of new tribes in limousines. With the confirmation of liars, thieves, and ghetto varders. In the wilderness of Pennsylvania Avenue, Standing Rock misspelled executive orders on yellow paper with crooked signatures. Where are the kind words? Language makers among us. At a time of extreme climate damage, deciphering fake news, alternative truths, and me-ism. You saw the 21st century and left us. Not on your own accord, our permission. You have fought and fought most of the 20th century, creating an army of poets and learned and loved language and stories. 
of complicated rivers, seas, and oceans? Where is the kind green nourishment of kale and wheatgrass? You thought, wrote, and lived poetry, knew that terror is also language-based on denial, firstism, and rich cowards. You were honey and yes to us. Never ran from black as in bones, Africa, blood, and questioning yesterdays and tomorrows. We never saw you dance, but you had rhythm. You were a warrior before the war creating earth language, uncommon signs and melodies, and did not sing the songs of career slaves. Keenly aware of Tubman, Douglas, Wells Barnett, Du Bois, and the oversized consciousness and commitment of never quit people, religiously taking note of the bloodless enemies of kindness, we hear your last words, America, if you see me as your enemy, you have no friends. <laughs> Congratulations, Paul. Happy Madagun. I'm definitely into that one. I won my round by one vote, so I'm real. <laughs> I'm a real lucky woman, and I like to make sure we get the luck going right. All righty, so now we are going to have a musical interlude. Or do I, yes, or no, I'm sorry, do I have you, Nora? Is that what I have down here? Yes, yeah, so Nora, yes. Oh, do, oh, wait a minute, we're doing number four? four. Round four, thank goodness. Four. I'm sorry. I got my mind back now. So here we go, yes, Rosina Kadari. Suman Chabra, is it Chabra? Okay. Jocelyn Ajami, Van Harris, and Asia, you know, I've known you longer than I've known everybody else here. And I'm gonna act like I'm gonna say your name right, and I will not. She was one of my students 20 years ago. Uh, no, I guess only 10 now. Yeah, about 10. I'm not gonna give her age away. So Asia Calgano. Okay, close enough. <laughs> Just know, it's me, not y'all. So first up, we have Rosina Kadari. Rosina, there you go. Thank you all so much. This is 8-21-2017. That's the day of the eclipse, in case you were wondering. We will continue to distract another war, to touch and go, to phone, to phone, to phone that window home that allows all to see and be seen always. Our footsteps, our fatigue, our buying habits, we will, we must continue buying things. It is how we have learned to survive. What a mother must be thinking, carrying four liters of Fanta for her kids and the kids of our neighbors on this Saturday where and when we both aren't working for a moment. Where and when we are both in motion, her east to the water, me to a line of stores at the city's end where the train stops, where fear is an act of kindness, where fear is believed in here, fear empty parking lots broken windows, pain and anger, anything visibly invisible will go there, fear only to buy things. The smell and texture of our bodies is our way of looking and thinking and loving and what's on sale today, what's in stock, where and how and what are priorities this month. It's how we have learned to survive, how I sometimes misbelieve my sister to be dead before remembering how she chose to kneel with strangers. Her new face, her new shape, her new name for her body, her body, her story, her story, the greatest story of any evening. She isn't dead, but she could be. 
always pretended, held that bread knife back and forth between our two necks, said she wasn't who I thought she was, back and forth. I repeated her name, A, A, and back and forth she whispered back, who is this person you're looking for? My sister always pretended her still body floated at the surface of swimming pools and I splashed over, heaved to turn her, turned her startled always by the sudden motion in her shoulders, breath. By the cadence of her open mouth's laugh, she taught me how to laugh, how to skip the terror of a single moment for beyond and back, back to the heat of a summer, it is how we have learned to survive back to enjoying the water. Thank you. Next up, we have Suman Chabra. Hi, everyone. This is called Thin. Today, for some reason, I thought I could call my mother to feel my tongue unloading crates of what I need to tell you now that she is ether. Moonstone teeth mashed together. I speak, but flowers fall from mouth. I am no harm to anyone, though lately I have tried to enunciate anger. But jaw. A yoga teacher said that the muscles of one's jaw should be no thicker than a credit card. And mine are layer over layer, so each morning I stretch and knead face as if preparing it for oven, even sleeping a form of aggression, wake up with the ache of what is held. Right hand still a fist pushed into mattress. Are you looking for wounds? Check my mouth, teeth moving as glaciers through the night, slicing ridges into both cheeks. Release a satellite into the canyon. Transmit the words I do not speak. Thank you. Jocelyn Ajami. Thank you everyone for being here and for supporting poets. Um, it's really, your support is really needed and we love you for it. I take courage from my fellow poets. You're all wonderful. Um, this poem uh, is called Still Until and it was written in solidarity and in memoriam. No, don't shoot, I'm already dead. The weight around my neck is heavier than lead. You choked me for a cigarette. Eleven times I cried despair. Eleven times you ignored my pleas. I am big, tall, and scared. My name is Eric Garner, a friend, a son, a father of six, and a reluctant martyr. No, don't shoot. I'm bewildered and confused in this gray and cluttered room. Was I searching for a broom? Why did I die so soon? My name is Dennis Grigsby. I was just holding a spoon. No, don't shoot, I'm already dead. My head is bloated, bruised, and red. Have you forgotten that Mississippi shed? I'm unarmed, wrestling with life at 18, heading for the college green. You shot me 12 times as I stumbled towards my dreams. I am Ferguson, Charleston, Baltimore, and so many more. Are you keeping score? My tears rain on your town every town. My name is Michael Brown. I'm just cruising the neighborhood, buying candy and juice. I like football and video games, math, music, and fixing planes. My name is Trayvon Martin. When I was nine, I pulled my father out of a fire. At 17, you shot me in the chest and threw us on the pyre. No, don't shoot, I'm already dead. You mutilated my body and shot me in the head. How long will the Tallahatchie River run red? I'm just fooling around, having fun with a plastic gun. I like to drum and draw and watch the winter thaw. 
The park is my greatest joy. You shot me for a toy. My 14-year-old sister raced to save me. You tackled her instead. Handcuffed and crazed, she witnessed my death. I am still, still so cold. My name is Tamir Rice. I am 12 years old. No, don't shoot, I'm already dead. This cotton gin fan is heavier than lead. You chased me for a whistle and a glance, gouged out an eye, mutilated my body, and drowned me for a lie. The year was 1955. Acquitted of your crimes, you served no time, killing me for a second time. When you confessed publicly, boasting double jeopardy, I died a third time, three times the parody. Still made of sorrow, my mother mourns tomorrow. She buried me in an open casket for you to face my bruised and bloated face. Her tears would not swallow the shame of Mississippi in the shadow of Chicago. Until the winds, until the winds disarm, I will lead the parade. Our voices will not fade. From the drawing board to the street, from the prison to the park, from the church to the creek, from the battlefield to my heart, I will shout to the choir. I will not surrender my strut or my stutter. I am friendly, curious, and bold. Still, until, I will never grow old. My name is Emmett Till. I am 14 years old. Van Harris. Um, to the people who came to support me today, if I just fall on the floor, like leave me here, it'll be great. <laughs> I'd be guest spot and casket. I'd be spit on concrete. I'd be cold, scraped diamond, tarnished gold pharaoh, King Nefertiti, or some other hypocrisy. My mama don't want me to Trayvon. Don't want my blood to slurp bullet. Don't want steel to bubble in my stomach like I'm supposed to digest stereotype, bleed out on my father's doorstep, and let him put my corpse in a dress for Easter Sunday. My granddaddy been dead for almost 15 calendars. Cadillac he only owned in my dreams still prom pretty in my father's garage. I'm afraid once the engine blows, he will die for real. Like all my memories will bleed away like the stain on my TMs under a toothbrush and I'll break, break, break. It's real hard for me to feel anyway. It's too hard for me to heal anyway. I am BPD and PMDD and OCD and SAD and you ain't you without me, boy. I burbed our love out my back, swaddled it in spinal cord. You think anything better than me, you can forget it. You think I believe what I just told you? I'm gonna regret it. My self-esteem has been hot combed by anxiety, depression, elementary school, middle school, and summer camp. It bubbles frightened at everything meant to fry it, but no matter how much heat is applied, it can never make me straight. I know, I do stupid things like spend money and buy crop tops I'm too self-conscious to wear and wake up late and go to bed early and spend money, all our money. My daddy always say he broke like he ever had to pay for me, so I rob my mama on Sundays. I'd be rigid. Gods at the throat from an intentional slit, an ache away from a knife in my wrist. I'd be black boy, a mothered, mothering, morphing man. I'm fine with not being my father's son now. I wanted to be his daughter then, but I started bleeding out the gender binary before the child support payments stopped. Suck on my demi boy identity like the sippy cup he gave me. He ain't never been no Hollywood. Honey, I'm home, movie father. Maybe just Disney, cause he's dead to me. I'd be guest spot and casket. I wish I would've jumped in with my sister. She'd been dead for three memorial services. And even without counting the days like obituary pages, I know it's been too long. I'm uncomfortable, she's gone. Fresh ghetto under the white man's shoes. I be guest spot in casket. I be spit on concrete. I be cold scraped diamond, tarnished gold pharaoh, Van Harris, or some other hypocrisy. And Asia Calcagno. 
Can y'all hear me? So it's the end. Can y'all do me a favor? Because going last is really hard. Can y'all just like show me or let me hear how y'all feeling right now? Thank y'all. Song from the Street, a golden shovel poem after Evie Shockley and after Gwendolyn Brooks. I am pedaling the rusted two-wheeler through the street, my eyes shut. Wheels humming gust and rubber strength when Eddie brings the children hand-me-down rides from the junkyard. He is a greased button down in trucker hat. Elders watch as the night comes slow. Children still riding their creaky metal like jockeys in the black until streetlights flicker like owl eyes. I pretend the bike is a maverick, pull on its two handlebar mains, an island of metallic melody, hooves hiccuping over rock. A thousand starlights flashing from bicycle frames, safe and sound as children zipping up and down avenues like pinballs, laughing hard through their pipe throats, feet fast and cycling, tiny, so tiny but making something go. Go, go, the body is alive. The body is alive as it should be, as a child should be. I am pedaling fast, fast as a sailfish through the shadow bottom of an ocean. I am a mouth of coral shining through the darkest night of a city, gleaming shell after shell on its reef. I don't know how you're going to do it, but you got to. You got to vote for one of these here poets, and all of them were amazing. Oh my goodness, I'm like so verklempt. Please clap for everyone. All right, so <laughs> we're going to count all of this up and come back with a winner. No, we're not. We're going to come back with the final round. And then y'all going to pick the winner from the final four. Yes, that's what we're doing. <laughs> and so, Beyond Jazz, are you ready for? Now? Oh, I'm sorry, Beyond Jazz, one more thing. Nora Brooks, Brooks Blake is supposed to come back up and do her presentation, and I'm sorry, so come on up, you got the book and everything. <laughs> okay, a, follow, a quick follow-up to, um, to, to, to what Haki said. Actually, we did see her dance. Oh, uh, there were a couple of play there are times that that did actually happen. She danced down the hallway of our near shotgun house to the tune of Errol Garner playing the piano on TV. And also at one memorable conference in Milwaukee, they were at an after event playing, uh, uh, dan doing the bus stop. And, uh, uh, Mama loved the bus stop, and so she got out there and decided she was going to do it. And so she was out there dancing with everybody else, and at one point she got stuck and didn't remember what she was supposed to be doing next. And so she just stood up there and stomped her foot until everybody got back around to the position she was facing, and then she went on. <laughs> so, yes. She danced too. Um, this piece is, and I've got to do a quick little shameless plug. The we are, as I mentioned, we are really excited about seasons. But one thing that we're doing now through October 27th is um, we're a tiny little company. We can't just 
give books out to everybody. But what we can do is, if you decide that you want to donate a copy, and this was something that Haki originally suggested about people donating copies of books of, uh, of seasons to uh, to schools, etc., and uh, and we're in this book is published in partnership, books permissions with Third World Press. So, if you decide to donate a copy or copies of the books to library, schools, shelters, etc., then uh, you can get the book or books at fifty percent off. So you could find that on GwendolynBooks.net, and that's just my little plug. The uh, the piece I wanted to do this time is a tip from Mama about writer's block. So she says, you're caught in the spell of your career. For weeks, for months, you have been writing poem after poem after poem, merrily or soberly, creating magic upon magic. Suddenly, writer's block. You cannot think of any way to deliver the conception in your consciousness to paper. You are sure you will never write another poem. All the wonder is heavy wood. Do not despair. Remember the following. No sickness continues in its exact state forever. The nature of life is change. In the grip of your sickness, treat the symptoms. Put down your pen, pick up your books, read, read, read. For excitement's sake, for nourishment's sake, study for the sake of enriching the source of your Nile. And can't see a thing. And live, go out into the world and cleanly involve yourself with the exhilarations of earth and air. Involve yourself with people young and old, new and known. Examine yourself. You are a vast world. Travel in it. Delve. Allow the necessary days to pass, weeks to pass, months to pass. Finally, return to your pen and paper. Begin to record ideas, impressions, persuasions in your waiting journal. When your hand again seems easy, write a poem. Expect to revise as usual and expect future blocks. Thank you. And since one of the things that she also talks about is the importance of getting your ideas and your feelings and your thoughts from so many different sources, that would be a perfect segue to jazz and beyond. <laughs>
final round. So here we go. The winner from the first round. Wait a minute. Uh, where's everybody? Because some of the winners aren't actually here. Okay. Stacia and Sasa, Wade for the first round. <laughs> Bianca Lisa Arojo. Tayana <laughs> for the third round. And Van Harris. We'll be reading in that order. Stasa, Wade. Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right. Um, this is Ebonics again. That's ghetto. No, 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 no. I mean, that's ghetto with a capital G. Not that lowercase way you say it. When you say it, it sounds dirty and scary and sharp like a bus stop steak knife, like, whoa. That does not belong here. Wonder how it got here. Wonder what it's been through. Definitely do not pick it up. Matter of fact, stop looking at it. It's ghetto. That's how you say ghetto. Me? I'm a capital G queen. I say it clean like my edges laid by God himself. I say it sweet like Kool-Aid, not your Kool-Aid. Your Kool-Aid tastes like dishwater. I say it sour like lemon salt we save our quarters for at the corner store. They both make my mouth pucker. I taste both in the back of my throat. They make me drool. Ghetto is that hood rich feeling after you get your check and before rent is due, parlaying the roach weed to a blunt, Windows down in the hoopty bumpin' that thing, that thing. Y'all know that part? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> uh, God bless Miss Lauren Hill. Weave so long, it swishes around your ass. Weave so long, they see you coming from down the block. Like, who is she? My ghetto is rhythm. It sways and bops in time with bare feet on concrete and double dutch and thick lips and thick hips. It two steps even on the hard days and we're never short on hard days. I say it loud from a big mouth. I say it loud, I'm reclaiming words. I'm reclaiming space. I'm on the north side with my dubs up, screaming, long live the west side. They taught me everything good about ghetto. <laughs> Bianca Lisa Arojo. I'm deeply, deeply humbled. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, like just even being a semifinalist has been hugely humbling. And you all are very exceptional poets. And I googled your names before I came, and I very much, very much psyched myself out. So thank you. <laughs> okay. The fusion of fault lines. I am strong. I think. My legs are not soft, hard instead. The base of a mountain. My shoulders tower high above the ground, my heart in the clouds. But my head higher, in the chill of the thin air, the clear, blinding light of the sun. My arms at either side ready to defend my core, avalanches assail, rock slides ravage, but my arms push against them and I am still once more unmovable. My back, shard upon shard, one piece indiscernible from the next before the cracks and fissures. My hands grasp tightly at any life that forms on me. I 
am a hostile environment. Sometimes there are trees too stubborn to grow anywhere else. But not for long. I am strong, I think, but you are an earthquake. And I have come to realize that I am a volcano. Eruptions send tremors through my base, straw lava from my lips, down my shoulders, which tower high above the ground. They erode from the heat, then are reformed, igneous and defiant. My head is engulfed in smoke, the blaze coming from the ardor of my heart. My arms have no defense against an earthquake. My feelings shock you. You assault my core from within. Do not expect a volcano to apologize for the inevitable. My back trembles and threatens to fall apart. Fault lines convulse, but shard upon shard are instead welded together. You pulverize stone, create sand that my hands Try to grasp tightly, slips through my fingers, so I learn to be softer, less hostile. I am made of rock still, but your power overwhelms mine, transforms me, forges me also in fire, reveals me to the world. I was strong. Now I am stronger. Thank you. Tayana Onamona. everyone um, this is such a great day uh, yeah that's it uh, <laughs> partner abuse it's a spinning spinning motion twisting tautly tightening tension it's a can't flee draw leash retract all sweet intention it's a not noose not new, notoriously neglected. It's a slight sight, subtle sign. I should come to expect this. I should come to reject this. But your light be bright, looming luminescence, the kind that leaves you breathless. Step away from the sun, Icarus, don't test this. I've come to slowly but surely ingest this. Tried to run but got snapped back. No eddy, this boomerang psycho death wish. I pray for death with every kiss. To escape this would be to languish in eternal bliss. This sweet absinthe, this poison piss. I lashed myself for seven years. What curse is this spinning, spinning, motion, twisting, tautly, tightening tension? Honey, you shrunk my love. Your shrink ray shrinks away my essence. In the eye of the storm, this magnetic field forlorn, I've tried to keep my distance. But your evil eye, a perverse sty, not seemingly life-threatening, but a bubbling under turns bubbling over as all your hatred festers and all my hatred festers. I nosedive into oblivion with no sense of self and no, and no material wealth or worthy gain though your accolades be drenched in my rouge pain. This love be sick nasty. This love be too taxi. Van Harris. Thank you. I, 
sometimes when I get nervous, I do like this little weird scream thing. Like if y'all have ever seen Bob's Burgers, I'm basically Tina, but like brown. Uh, so yeah, uh, let's do this. I be guest spot in casket. I be spit on concrete. I be cold scraped diamond, tarnished gold pharaoh, King Nefertiti, or some other hypocrisy. My mama don't want me to Trayvon. Don't want my blood to slurp bullet. Don't want steel to bubble in my stomach like I'm supposed to digest stereotype, bleed out on my father's doorstep and let him put my corpse in a dress for Easter Sunday. My granddaddy been dead for almost 15 calendars. Cadillac he only owned in my dream still prom pretty in my father's garage. I'm afraid once the engine blows, he would die for real. Like all my memories will bleed away like a stain on my Tim's under a toothbrush and I'll break, break, break. It's too hard for me to heal anyway. It's real hard for me to feel anyway. I am BPD and PMDD and OCD and SAD and you ain't you without me, boy. I burped our love out my back, swaddled it in spinal cord. You think anything better than me, you can forget it. You think I believe what I just told you? I'm gonna regret it. My self-esteem has been hot combed by anxiety, depression, elementary school, middle school, and summer camp. It bubbles frightened at everything meant to fry it, but no matter how much heat is applied, it can never make me straight. I know, I do stupid things like spend money and buy crop tops I'm too self-conscious to wear and wake up late and go to bed early and spend money, all our money. My daddy always say he broke like he ever had to pay for me, so I robbed my mama on Sundays. I'd be rigid gauze at the throat from an intentional slit, an ache away from a knife in my wrist. I'd be black boy, a mothered, mothering, morphing man. I'm fine with not being my father's son now. I wanted to be his daughter then, but I started bleeding out the gender binary before the child support payment stopped. Suck on my demi boy identity like the sippy cup he gave me. He ain't never been no, honey, I'm home, Hollywood movie father. Maybe just Disney, cause he's dead to me. I be guest spot in casket. My sister been dead for three memorial services and even without counting the days like obituary pages, I know it's been too long. I'm uncomfortable, she's gone. Fresh ghetto under the white man's shoes. I be guest spot in casket. I be spit on concrete. I be cold scraped diamond, tarnished gold pharaoh, Van Harris, or some other hypocrisy. <laughs> Your job is much harder than mine, and y'all are much better than me. Because I'd find a way to like, can I just circle all the names? Ah. I know, yeah, you can't do that, though. That gets thrown out, that means you didn't vote, and that's awful. So let's all be good, keep it lit, keep it right, get your vote on. First round, we had, I'm sorry, does everybody have their, their ballot? OK, good. So we have Stacey Wade, Bianca Lisa Arujo, Tayana Onumonu, and Van Harris. Make sure you get your votes in so we don't have to have a runner go and take your votes at the last second. Please and thank you. I'd like for you to let, I mean, I'd like to let you know that uh, the Guild Complex would love your tax uh, <laughs> deductible donations. You can donate anything that you want, anything that you like, but you can also put on, you know, if you're writing a check, like something that you'd like to see us do. The Guild Complex takes all kinds of suggestions. We want to be, right, that literary organization that you want us to be. Because we're here for you. Back in the day, there was a hip hop song that went, whose world is this? And the response was, the world is mine. Well, I don't like that, because I'm at the Guild Complex. 
So when I say, whose guild is this? You say, the guild is mine. The guild is mine. So whose guild is this? The guild is mine. The guild is mine. Yeah, especially when you donate. And so therefore, we would love for you, anytime that you feel like you have a program idea, give us a call. But then also feel free to drop a few you know, ducats uh, online. Do we have some online payment options for people for the guild complex? Maybe we do. And so then we'll figure that one out for you too. So we want that to happen. And now, while we wait to see who actually won this round, more Jazz and Beyond. No, oh, 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 oh. 
Oscars and awards kind of thing. So you know, we got to like build up to it. And some other things I'm going to tell you first. So <laughs> everyone who read tonight, all of our uh, semifinalists will get two free passes to the American Writers Museum. So you get to come back and actually hang out and really see a place that one day you'll see your own name in. So that's going to be wonderful and fantastic. Um, and then we want to say a special thanks to the Can TV. Thank you, Luis, for being such a great cameraman and keeping us on. We definitely want to thank our wonderful band, Jazz and Beyond. Thank you. And so, <laughs> I don't know. Lisa, why don't you come on up here for a second? So this year, we uh, also had a special donation that was just given by Haki Matabudi. And so all of the finalists um, will receive $50. <laughs> yeah. 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 You can do no, I'm just gonna be. <laughs> I'm gonna get that now together with the winner. So, here you go. One, two, three. No, the finalist gets this. Okay. Yeah. So one piece. Okay. So come on up. Um, Stacey. Stacey, where? No, she does not. Monique. Bianca Lisa Arojo. And Tiana Onamona. Please give her. Can you hand them up? <laughs> it's an open moment. You get a 50. <laughs> and you get a 50. <laughs> and you get a 50. <laughs> And so normally the winner gets just uh, the $500 check, but since we're at this fabulous museum, Van Harris, not only do you get the check, but you get a year's membership to the American Writers Museum. What you gonna do with that $500? <laughs> uh, Y'all don't know this, but uh, I am a child. I'm not, actually, I'm 19, so I'm basically a child, and college is expensive, so that's what that's going for, probably. Um, actually, no, for real. <laughs> here to calm her down a little bit. I remember what this was like. I didn't think I was going to win. Then they said I did. You all right? Everyone, I'd like for you to introduce you to your 2017 Gwendolyn Brooks Open Mic Award winner. 